So gentlemen, we're coming close to say hello to the auditorium and we are ready to take questions. At the moment, we have no questions on screen. I may ask something very generic. What do you think is the difference between SIC and GAN for applications in general? To the public. Whoever of you is uh, willing to start answering that generic question should start. Sure, I can. I can. I can. I can start with that, Bodo. Um, so, uh, Bill from Transform. Uh, so, what we're seeing basically is, you know, as you move, so our technology, we're basically ranging anywhere from 30 watts all the way up to 10 kilowatts now with our technology. And depending on what application and what power level, we're actually we're actually either directly competing um, with the incumbent silicon or with uh, the silicon carbide. So what we're seeing is kind of on a two two kilowatt and below power power level. We're looking more at kind of a silicon level, especially if we get into the power adapters, as uh, Tech Insight talked about. Is that's kind of a growing market um, near term revenue for for gallium nitride. Uh, but then as we move from two kilowatts and above, where we start getting into form factor um, solutions where the form factor does not change or constraints, then what we have is we actually have, uh, we're, we're now competing directly against silicon carbide as, as the incumbent. So depending on the power level really is kind of defining what we're seeing out there, whether we're directly competing against silicon or silicon carbide. Thank you. So the next question is, when we will see the first design wins for GAN in inverters for electro vehicles? I can pick it up. <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Another question came up as well, right? Okay, I believe the uh, first uh, inverter GAN designing probably will happen around uh, 2022, the earliest. And uh, that's probably the optimistic view. And, uh, but before, by 2024, I'm sure there will be inverter design wind happening certainly in the uh, XCV market. Uh, the next one, I think, probably is directly related to uh, Nexperia. So I'll be taking yeah. up that one. Uh, it's not clear how Nexperia has measured the efficiency up to six, seven kilowatt in the half bridge demo setup, as shown on this slide and 20. To give more details, right? I think uh, there are some uh, information given there. It's actually between 200 and uh, 30 or 240 volts to 200 volt, yeah, 400 volt. And that's the uh, conversion. And that's what gives, uh, we take it up to six to seven kilowatt that you have seen in that um, efficiency trace. Thank you. The next question is, built-in driver seems indispensable for fast charger applications. But do you think that the built-in or integrated gate drivers also required or discrete devices are required for server or automotive applications? Sure, I'll take that question. This okay. is Raman here from Lamanen. Texas Instruments. <laughs> Yeah, the advantage of the built-in gate driver is indispensable for any application where you really want to harvest the benefits of 
the high switching speed figures of merit of GAN. Um, so I wouldn't restrict um, the thinking that a built-in gate driver is driving smaller form factors and lower cost, and it's only applicable for fast chargers. Any application where you're trying to reduce the power density, make things smaller, or get more out of uh, this more heat, more power processed through the same size, anything where you're trying to operate at high switching frequencies can and should benefit when you have an integrated gate driver along with the gallium nitride power fit, power fit closely packaged together. You know, one thing is the good figures of merit, uh, switching figures of merit in terms of the low capacitances and low charge in GAN, but then to really extract the benefit of that figure of merit, you want to make sure that the board circuit traces are not delivering too high parasitic inductances, which can make the switching, high switching frequency operation very difficult. So I would say the integrated gate driver approach is applicable in all applications, server, IT communication power supplies, automotive chargers, high voltage DC-DC converters, as well as small fast chargers for mobile devices such as tablets and mobile phones. Thank you. The next question is for Tech Insights. When will Apple move the using GAN for its own charges and does the move by Apple to not inbox charges mean that the market opportunity is small? So as I, I, I will answer that, of course, it's engine here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we believe that Apple will probably, and Samsung and the other major OEMs will bring out a GAN-based charger, you know, in the next year or so, um, because you know, people want uh, high power chargers for fast charging and small form factor for obvious reasons. Uh, the, the, the trend that Apple is not providing a charger with their phones, yeah, that is kind of interesting because it does lead people to the opportunity to buy whatever charge they want. So I, I haven't thought about that. Um, completely. But I, I believe the market for these chargers is large since everybody I know carries a device around and would like to charge it every day. Okay, thank you. So I can actually go back to the previous question, which is uh, yeah. has answered about integrated driver. And there are, uh, the, I think opinion is divided for higher power applications where a junction temperature where you can actually push your discrete devices to 175C, which we do, and where the integrated driver actually can inhibit, especially some of the applications where very high frequency is not required. And, but uh, like a server or automotive application where the power level is much higher, uh, not integrating the driver actually allow you beyond 125 degrees C so that you can make your device operated up to 175. So you can actually push uh, the boundary of your power handling capability and the power density. Uh, uh, the, in the quick charging applications, I believe uh, is indispensable in that sense, uh, but uh, not for very high power where you can um, relish the higher temperature capability uh, of the semiconductor. Just to compliment her. Yeah, and, and, and Bodo, I'd just like to add to that is as you go, as Dilder was saying, as you go higher in power, you end up um, not having that ability to kind of really pull that heat out um, and limit it on the junction temperature. You end up having to parallel devices. And as you parallel more and more devices, obviously that reduces your power density and also uh, increases the cost of the system. So you wanna be able to use the technology that fits the proper application and power level. So as you go from low power, you know, definitely uh, the, uh, the, the driver, it, uh, the driver is definitely, um, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's a good place for the driver, but as you get into the kilowatts of area, um, the discrete solution really uh, becomes a, a nice solution uh, or the preferred solution as you uh, get to high power to limit the number of devices as well as uh, the performance of uh, the technology. Thank you, Philip. So the next question is, 
I'd like to know in the supply chain, what's the bottleneck for GAN in the future years? Epitaxia Foundry or major OEMs to adapt? So I, I can jump onto that one, uh, Bodo. So what we're seeing is basically with, with Transform being a vertically integrated organization, um, we actually don't see a bottleneck moving forward because uh, we know we're capable of being able to ramp up to, with our current situation, up to 50 million devices a year based on a 50 million uh, device. So whether it's, um, you know, we have two locations for Epi, we have two MOCVDs in Goleta, California. We have, I mean, three in Goleta. We have two in, in Aizu, Japan. Um, but we have the, uh, the manufacturing facility, which again is able to do more than 50 million devices a year. Um, packaging, uh, we use standard off-the-shelf packaging, so no, no bottleneck there. So really it's more about kind of the adoption of the technology um, that's gonna drive. Um, but I will say that um, one of the concerns about uh, GAN that has been brought up is the, uh, the yields. And um, Transform has been um, basically uh, shipping silicon-like yields. We've been having silicon-like yields out of our fab since 2015. So we don't see any issue. And if we do have any issues with, with supply, um, we, can, we can move from a six inch to an eight, eight inch wafer on silicon. So that's not, that's, that's, we don't really see um, a bottleneck when it comes to, uh, uh, at least for, for, for transform. And then the next question is, what is the roadmap for 900 and 1200 volt devices? Well, um, I'll take that one as well. Uh, so transform currently, we actually currently sell uh, have released uh, two 900 volt devices, a 180 milliohm, and a TO220, as well as a 50 milliohm and a TO247. So we're already involved with the 900 volt uh, technology, and we're also um, in development on uh, 1200 volt technology moving forward. So a nice breadth of technology from 650 volt through 1200 volt for a uh, transform. Bodo, I'd like to also go back to the uh, previous question in terms of the bottlenecks. I, you know, I actually see increased superior adoption um, of GAN in many markets, uh, certainly in automotive as well as in uh, server, data center, and telecommunication power supplies. There are different trends which are actually playing to the uh, benefits and the uh, strengths of GAN. In uh, telecom power supplies, for example, the, uh, with 5G base stations uh, becoming more power intensive and uh, being more localized, the need to hang these base stations at several um, local locations like street poles and on the sides of buildings is demanding lighter uh, power supplies with uh, smaller rate of heat sinks, no convection cooling, things like that. So all of these markets are actually adopting gallium nitride very positively. And from a manufacturing and supply chain perspective, the choice of um, how uh, TI has decided to do it, we build our gallium nitride devices on Silicon substrate, which is extremely widely available, already available anywhere from 200 to 300 millimeters from many suppliers. All of our manufacturing is 100% in-house. We don't depend on any foundries. So we're able to really leverage existing uh, capacities in our manufacturing facilities to really offer high uh, supply chain throughput for these gallium nitride devices. <clears throat> Thank right. you. The next question in the row is addressed to Nexperia in Texas. Instruments, what's the business model in GAN? Do they have internal FAP with Epitaxi uh, integrated? Yeah, we, um, from the Nexperia, I'm responding to that one. Um, uh, we subscribe uh, the Epi, but we have got our own FAP and that's what's going to be the standard for our business model. And our backend for the packaging is our in-house as well. So that's our business model. Yeah, and as I mentioned for TI, it's 100% internal TI manufacturing facilities. <clears throat> okay, thank you. The next question is, General address, so, do you still need to so, fight reliability concerns for gun power switching products or did AEC dash Q101 qualified products remove this perception in the power community? 
So I think Obo, I mean, sorry, Bodo, I think the thing is with, with quality and reliability with gallium nitride, I think this is always going to be a question from our, from our um, designers and our customers because GAN does not naturally come from the power electronics world. So it's still fairly new to the, uh, to, yeah. to the community. But being that we've released uh, Q101 devices since 2000 and 2000 and, uh, 2017, um, at both 150 and then in 175 degrees C in 2018, um, you know, with a current fit rate of less than one and over 10 billion, uh, 10 billion hours of uh, field reliability data, you know, we can definitely show kind of, you know, transforms technology, you know, as showing kind of best in class quality and reliability. But, but, you know, customers still, you know, you know, still bring that up as a, as, a, you know, as one of the multidimensional uh, questions that they have, but, you know, I think as, you know, Gantt's suppliers come more and more online, um, they're, they're coming out with the quality reliability reports. Like we do a yearly um, quality reliability uh, press release. Uh, we report our quality reliability every year to stay totally um, open, kind of open kimono, uh, totally transparent with our customers because this is, this is information. You know, they need to understand when wear out. They need to understand early life failure. And this is something that we focus our technology and it's part of the foundation of Transforms technology. I guess to Thank, add, you. Thank yes. you, Phil. Yes, some of the things uh, I'd like to just add, uh, the ACQ101, uh, if you want to qualify the GAN products, you'll have to do that as a minimum. Then you'll have to do a few very GAN specific like your dynamic audio sound, your transient over voltage capability, and uh, the your transient spike capability and others, as you know, that again, don't have the avalanche capability, that sensor and the clamp performance. So these are some of the extra, as you know, that the uh, JDEC uh, 70.1, the GAN team is currently working on to uh, define some of the very specifics to the uh, GAN, power GAN devices beyond ACQ 101. So those need to be, uh, um, together to remove the perception of GAN's concerns. Yeah, I think we are well past that point. I mean, reliability is a statistical science, and uh, we've had over 10 years of investment in GAN, and all of this time has been utilized for us to really collect consistent data about GAN. And um, as Dilair mentioned, you know, ACQ 101 is table stakes. You know, you need it. Uh, but there's so much more which you've already accumulated in terms of knowledge, in terms of failure modes, in terms of switching stress, uh, lifetimes, and uh, time-dependent breakdown lifetimes. All of this has been already characterized. So there's a wealth of knowledge already available um, across a broad set of the suppliers you see here. And so I think the industry is pretty well fast. The question is GAN reliable anymore. Um, I think uh, there's enough data available across the board for us to be able to speak to the strength of that. Thank you. The next question is, what do you think of bulk GAN for power application, especially for high voltage, 1200 volt device and higher? I think uh, that had been answered in the one question where 912. No, no this, this one is a very specific about bulk um, gallium nitride, not uh, uh, GAN on uh, silicon or sapphire. It's, this is a bulk GAN, and the first thing would be it's a very expensive, <laughs> and the wafer size would be smaller. So um, we are waiting because there are research ongoing, and it it has a potential uh, until it's economically viable. I think uh, it will remain to be seen uh, how quickly it will be adopted. Okay, it, thank you. The next question is addressed to Nexperia about the ramp app for electric vehicle or hybrid electric vehicle application. Uh, is it for onboard applications? Yeah, on, yeah, on board. Yeah, the hour, um, obviously, we have released a couple of devices and uh, we are bringing. Uh, large suite of devices in the first half of 2021. So, and as it is coming, we are ready for ramp up. So 2021, 
is a very big year for uh, our industrialization and the ramping up uh, provision available for uh, the um, capacity requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regarding charging technology, is wireless charging as a potential application for GAN devices? Wireless charging, to me, has a wide range. We know it, my cell phone has a wireless charging. Uh, uh, and the and truck has got wireless charge, electric bus but has wireless charge. Electric charging. vehicle would be the challenge to charge it wireless, to overcome the problems with mishandling the plugs. I know that there was something in London going, was London taxis uh, getting wireless charge, electro vehicle use, using wireless charging pads in London. I could yeah, comment, I think. I think. Please go ahead. So uh, in terms of applications to the mobile wireless charging, I, I think the, the tech difficulty in the technology wireless charging is the inductor coils and coupling the power from the charger into the phone or the tablet. Um, the form factor is not that important. So I would not I would have thought that it's unlikely that the wireless charging market is thinking about using GAN right now. They have uh, other problems they're trying to solve. And make make them more efficient. They're not. I don't believe they're particularly efficient at the moment. Yeah. I was to just going to add charging. that you know, from a GAN application perspective, you know, um, wireless charging for automotive, you know, very high power, space constrained, where you have to park the car over uh, areas inside your garage through which the wireless charging happens. Anyway, there's small space available and a lot of power to be processed, which means there's more power density to be handled. Um, GAN has a good location there. Um, especially when it comes to topologies like resonant topologies, which is commonly used soft switching in um, wireless charging. Um, GAN shines very well because of the fact it has very low capacitances between its drain and source for a given voltage rating and a given RDS on rating of the device. That's interesting. Okay, for the last five minutes, we need to speed up. The next question is, does the need to be 30 or more companies all doing AP in-house and GAN. Why does the industry not consolidate around using, let's say, TSMC for foundry so that GAN companies can focus on the device side? Well, I think Bodo, I think, uh, for example, Epi is, that's really the secret sauce. That's a competitive advantage for a number of organizations, right? TI does their own, we do our own. Um, you know, the, this is something that we have, uh, you know, we have over the many, many patents wrapped around. It's, it's something that it's not easy, um, but it also gives us the ability to, to give our customers the best in class reliability with performance to match. So being able to turn the knob of the EPI, the design, as well as the process that we own really gives us that competitive advantage in the market to offer the silicon like yield. Um, and uh, just, you know, to, to be able to deliver the technology to our customers that is, you know, uh, you know, that is a really, really good technology. So I think, you know, if you don't, and it takes a long time to develop that EPI experience. So, um, if you don't have that expertise in house, then yeah, you can go with TSMC. But you know, you're 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 doing like a me too me too uh, a me too solution, and this is where um, you know this is where uh, Transform really adds um, adds value to uh, to the to gallium nitride in, in the market and our customers. Thank you, Philip. The next question is. Given that power integration had so much success with scan on Sapphire, does that mean other fast charging players will follow? I can take this up. Yeah. I don't think uh, everyone needs to follow the same suit. Uh, 
Ganon Silicon has got uh, also integration capability. So Ganon Silicon can go ahead because uh, one of the things is that this fast charging or the quick charging is based on 650. So the Ganon Silicon is quite well suited for that one where you can integrate the, uh, the driver. So I don't think people will all follow the same route, uh, but there are discrete uh, separate driver, integrated driver, and separate controller, integrated controller. So these are all different apologies and different configuration people will try to get the best out of the combination through the, uh, their supply chain and uh, procurement where they get the best value out. I have an observation. Thank you. So I, I, I would observe that the, the benefit of using the GAN on Sapphire is that the, it's a lot easier to grow the EPI. So when we did our analysis, the EPI is much simpler in the power integrations device than say Navitas or, or Transform, um, which we've analyzed. So I, you know, obviously they've saved money on their EPI, but they have a more expensive substrate. It's harder to handle in a conventional wafer fab designed for handling silicon wafers. And so, you know, there's pluses and minuses. Uh, obviously, for power integrations, the plus is one out, but that might not be the case for somebody else running in another fab. Um, you know, it's uh, we don't know where power integrations made their wafers at the moment. I'd be interested to know that if anybody knows. Okay. The next question, and we have to hurry on, two minutes left. When will Texas Instruments start high volume production for automotive applications with an automotive OEM? Would it be for an onboard charging or main inverters? I can take that. You know, we really see the sweet spot for gallium nitride and automotive around onboard chargers and high voltage DC DC converters, where we are really dealing with tens of amperes of current. You know, where you need hundreds of amperes of current, like in the inverters, we think that's not the sweet spot where gallium nitride is focused on at the moment. Um, there has been a tremendous level of activity with the parts we have sampled to various automotive tier ones and OEMs in the onboard charger space. Um, the integrated driver and the high switching capability is highly appreciated. There was earlier a comment about temperature limitation of the integrated driver. Um, automotive grade zero gate drivers are plentifully available. So there's nothing fundamentally stopping gate driver also having a higher temperature capability. Um, Texas Instruments, we're planning to um, uh, release our parts in late 2021, early 2022 timeframe. And pretty soon you'll see cars on the road with, with uh, gallium nitride devices from our technology. Thank you. The last question is what limits GAN or SIC application? Is it cost matters only? I think uh, just the power application is cost, if I can take it. Um, uh, but uh, as you know that the GAN on silic uh, silicon carbide is already being used in the RF application where you have got the very concentrated heat generated and the silicon carbide is good for the thermal conductivity. So uh, at high uh, expensive devices in RF, they are okay. But for power application is a very price sensitive market and it's cost that uh, limits it. So Bodo, I'd also like to add to that, that as, a, as, a, as a customer, as a cu true customer solution is not only the cost, Matt, because obviously cost matters to everybody. But the thing is, is that the higher performance of the electron mobility, um, the electron mobility of, uh, of, of gallium nitride over silicon carbide, there's such a difference that I have a customer that the only solution they could use because of a form factor that was that, that would not change is using a gallium nitride device, even silicon carbide could not uh, perform to that level. And you know we're able to show at least a 25% um, re a reduction in losses against uh, leading uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs. So I think it really, really comes down to is as you get into these smaller form factors and higher power levels, GAN just is able to uh, supersede the uh, silicon carbide and also uh, operate at a, um, uh, and, and be supplied at, at a lower cost. Yeah, Philip, the question Thank you. is get on silicon sub covered yeah. substrate. Oh, sorry, get on silicon. Oh, that's a, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, yeah, on silicon carbon. Yeah, true enough. Sorry. Which is My only mistake, used in RF. I, I incorrectly read. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. 
Yeah, I think it's more yeah. than cost. It's also throughput and supply chain. Again, in the size of the wafers, wafers and the number of chips you get out of each wafer matters to really assure, assure the supply chain capability for large volume manufacturing production. So I think um, GAN on silicon is a much more superior way to approach the problem because uh, the fundamental challenges of large wafer sizes in silicon are already solved. It's highly amortized technology. And now it's simply a matter of, again, you know, developing the GAN growth, epitaxial growth technologies on top of the silicon substrate. So um, I think there are benefits to be had in cost as well as in supply chain throughput uh, when it comes to GAN on silicon as compared to GAN on silicon carbide. Gentlemen, thank you for the fruitful discussions. We have to let the next sessions start and uh, stay safe and looking forward to a healthy next year to meet in reality again and have a conference. Thank you very much. See you again. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Bottom. <laughs> Bye. Very well organized Thanks, event. Thank you very much. Thanks for the questions.